When it comes to music theory, there's no such thing as knowing too much. No matter what genre you work in or what instrument you play, there's always something new to learn and explore. But the truth is, in order to get by or get started, we actually need to know very little. The absolute basics of knowing what a key, what a chord, and what a scale is could be enough to build a solid foundation to creating music that's both immersive and enjoyable to listen to. But when it comes to ambient music, what if I told you that everything you knew about music theory was theoretically correct, but none of it mattered? I started exploring the vast world of music theory in my early days as a self-taught guitar player. After teaching myself how to play, I started asking important questions like, what is a key? Why do certain chords work together and some don't? What is a circle of fists and how do I use it? There never seemed to be an end to my questions. I was determined to know the answers as they appeared to hold the keys, no pun intended, to what my real goal was, writing good music. While these are important questions, it's important to remember that you don't need a degree in music for these concepts to be fully understood. In fact, you don't even need a proper lesson. Some of the greatest musicians in history never learned a bit of music theory using only their ear and their intuition as their guide. With so many amazing tools for production out there, it's hard not to get drawn into the latest and the greatest as far as tools go. These tools can be used to create beautiful results, but when you strip everything down, it still comes down to the basics, frequency, pitch, and music theory. Ambient is so open-ended that you could literally throw anything together and come out with something that sounds good, contains the feeling that you're after, and doesn't have any resemblance to the original source, sample, or musical phrase. But what if there was another way, somewhere in the middle where the knowledge that you did have could be applied in a way that allowed you to break the rules whenever you felt called to or compelled to do so? This can be what some producers experience when they first get into ambient music. All of the prior knowledge they had in whatever genre or instrument they have a background in gets left behind and they realize that it isn't so much about the notes that they're playing, it's about how they're processing those notes. Synthesizers, effects, delays, reverbs, these are all the hallmarks of ambient electronic music as we know it. But with that comes the complexity of keeping things glued together or over-processing your existing material. Outside of all the fancy tools and sequencers that we have available to us these days, just to make things easier, there's still a ton of value in knowing at least a bit of music theory to help guide you along the way. You don't need to build up a ton of chord changes or notes in a row just to make something sound interesting or provide movement. If you keep things relatively simple and centered around one key, that might be all that you need to build a foundation for a track. Oftentimes ambient music is played in such a slow tempo that changes in pitch happen over a longer period of time, therefore giving you the flexibility to be intentional about your chord changes as the track progresses. Stick to two, three, or four note chords and slowly move them over time. As long as you're still playing in the same scale, no matter where you go, everything will still sound as if it's part of a larger whole. More often than not, most ambient music tracks don't change keys in the middle of a track. If they do, this is often the suggestion of a completely different passage or even a signal that the song is going in a different direction. You can still use different chords inside of one key and stay in that key as long as you use some of, if not all of the same notes within. Some techniques you might consider using is taking some of the notes that you used in one chord and moving them down an octave or two. You might also take some of the notes you used in your root chord that aren't the root note and make those notes the root of your next chord. You technically still have the same chord, but it sounds completely different. Another technique that's specific to ambient music is to layer your sounds based on the key you are playing in. By using layers and separating out harmonic frequencies, you can get some really interesting and dynamic sounds and textures just by separating out the notes across multiple layers. Think about this. Not all notes need to be in the same chord using the same instrument. If you minimize your note usage and then layer multiple instruments on top of each other, you avoid oversaturating one sound by eliminating dense frequencies, therefore creating a wider field of sound. It allows the listener to experience the same notes from different angles, giving them a panoramic view of your sound palette and the producer a wider field of sound to work with. 
So here we are in front of my push two, ta-da. And we're gonna talk about some music theory concepts relating specifically to ambient music. Um, this is not going to be a push to tutorial. This, I'm just using push because this is what I have. It's what I use. Um, I love my push two. It's just really a wonderful input device. Uh, if it ever broke down on me, I'd probably get another one. Uh, hopefully we'll see the release of a push three at some point. Uh, and if they ever do do that, hopefully if any Ableton engineer or designer ever watches this video, just remove the rubber from the sides of the back, okay? <laughs> That's the only request I have. Everything else is perfect about the device. Um, so anyway, uh, we're gonna talk about some music theory concepts relating to ambient music here. Now I have my push to in the force layout. We're also gonna use the key of A minor because that's the key that everyone uses when they talk about basic ambient music or at least music theory concepts. So my push two is laid out in force, which means that every three notes, you're gonna get a full scale. So check it out. So it's gonna be, you just use three fingers to walk up the scale just like this. Now I have, again, I have my push in scale mode in A minor. Okay, that's very important if you're following along, all right? So we're also listening to an instance of Hive. Um, I should also mention that. Um, it's just a basic sawtooth with a filter on it. And um, yeah, I also have some of my plugins there on the top. You can see those. Uh, one is um, inside of the uh, MIDI utilities folder. It's the MIDI monitor. And so that just basically tells you, gives you a sort of a loose interpretation of what chord you're playing, which is really helpful. So if I'm playing these three notes, it's just telling me I'm playing an A minor. So that could be helpful if you're working on music theory concepts. Um, and I also have a tuner there on the top um, to tell you exactly what note. So if you're really searching for a note, you wanna find something, um, a tuner, which is available on most any DAW, um, will tell you exactly what note you are hitting. So um, let's talk about this. So we're working in the key of A minor again. So um, when I approach making some chords, um, you know, you obviously wanna go for, you wanna pick a key. Now on my push two, I'm able to pick a key and not miss a note, and that's really helpful. But if you're just using a straight key bed, um, you know, a good place to start would be a minor key, uh, especially with ambient music. So I often pick minor keys because they have sort of a dark, ominous tone. You can also pick a Dorian uh, key. You could go for a Lydian key, you know, like, I mean, major keys are harder to work with, I think, because the root always comes back to this sort of like, ethereal happy place, but most of the music that I make starts in that sort of like void, dark space. So uh, it goes without saying that minor keys really fit the bill there. So anyway, um, when you're playing three notes, you have just a basic minor chord, okay? So that's basically A, C, and E, right? So that's kind of a good place to start. Now, a lot of us talk about, well, what chords are you using on push? What chords are you using in general? when it comes to ambient music, and how do you change those chords between each other? So let's talk about that. Um, the first chord I like to start with is probably a minor chord. Now, if you, on the push, it's so convenient. If you start moving up like this, you're gonna, you're gonna start getting this, all the chords in the scale. Imagine that. So it just starts off and you have A minor, and then it goes on, you have B diminished, and then it moves on, you have C major, and then you have D minor. So all the chords that you would actually need inside of a key are with the same shape moving across the board. And that's really convenient. Um, again, this is very push specific, but um, if you're looking to change chords, wow, you could just go from here to here and then move up again and then move back to the root chord. So you think about it, it's like the ultra easy mode layout, right? So that's kind of convenient, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about what chords am I using? Uh, specifically, a minor chord is a good place to start. Now, we what we call in music, when we say we use the first, second, and fifth note, that's called a sus two, okay? So as you can see, when I'm playing the first, second, and then the fifth, that's a sus two chord. Now, sus two chord is considered neutral, meaning it doesn't have any minor or major tonality to it. So a good place to start would be maybe a sus two chord or a sus four chord. And what sus four means, means you use the first, fourth and fifth degree of the scale. So on a push, this is this. So on, uh, if you're following along on a key bed, it's just A, D, and E. That's a sus four. Now, if I play a root note lower than that, that's a beautiful chord to start, right? So you could start there and then move into a minor, right? And so together with those two chords, you're sort of setting the tone, okay? So you could also use a sus two because it's sort of, again, a neutral chord 
that has sort of a suspended ethereal quality to it. So that's a good place to start. Now, that's step one. Um, another chord that I also like to use is the, I guess they call this a, a seventh sus four, but on push, when you just hit the first, fifth, and seventh, that makes a really nice seventh chord. It also makes a really nice shape. So you often see me and I'm just going like this and I'll just randomly by default, it makes a nice natural shape in the force layout. So that's a seventh chord, if you will. Um, and that could be another good like contrast to the minor. So if you have a minor chord and then you have a seventh chord and then you have a sus four chord, you're still all in the same key. You haven't left, but at least you're providing some variation on the chords that you're changing to. Before we move on from the subject of chords, I just wanna mention one secret chord that I use a lot in my music um, that's not often talked about. And I don't even know what chord this is, but uh, it's the first, second, and third degree of a minor scale. And I don't even think it is a chord. Um, but if you think about this, and you put this in context, and then you limit the frequency of this chord range, that comes out, like if what I do is I'll take a high pass filter and I'll take a low pass filter and I'll just, I'll just squunch it up together and this can create a really tense uh, chord shape. So it's just the first, second, and third degrees of a minor scale and I don't know what you call it. I, I first discovered listening to um, Ultimate Records, AS Dana, I mean just like, you know, think about that in a pad context, it can be really cool. Uh, so now let's move on to the concept of inversion. So when you have a minor chord, basically just A, C, and E, uh, if you pick the, another note out of that chord and use that as the root, that can be another great way to create variation in your chord. So for example, if I put the root on C and then put E over here and A over here, let's see A over here. Now we're, we're playing the same chord, but it's a totally different layout, right? So you can think about that like, and you can say, okay, we'll have A here, C here, and then E here, right? That's another way to play the same chord, but in a different context. So inverting the chord can also help. Now you could do this on your key bed. You could just do it penciling in the notes. Um, it's a really, you know, really common technique is just using inversion. Now, what is even more powerful, I think when you talk about chord changes when it comes to ambient is, a lot of the times we don't change keys, or at least I don't change, completely change keys. Like I don't go from like A minor to say, I don't know, D sharp major in the same song. It's really hard to do that um, and make it convincing that you meant to go there. Um, so what I often do is I will change chords, but I'll keep the root note the same, all right? So for this example, I'm going to pull up a pad so you guys can kind of get a better um, concept of how this would sound in ambient music. And here's one of my favorite pads that I've made lately. Um, it's called Target Signal. And um, I'm just gonna start playing it here. Now, if I'm playing this as a pad, right? It's again, Hive 2. Um, if I go ahead and I change the chord on the top end, but leave the root the same, uh, I'm inherently changing the feeling of the chord completely. but keeping the root note based, right? So that's one technique, right? So you could say, well, I'm going to change to either D minor or C major, but keep the root note based in A. So think about that in terms of your chord changes, keeping one root note as your foundation, and then you can do all kinds of different stuff with a top end as if you were playing with say a left and a right hand on a regular piano, okay? And it still provides a sense of movement, but you haven't changed anything inherently within the key. So that's one way to do it. The other way would be to keep the chord the same, but then start changing the bass note underneath it. And I do this a lot. So I'll start with a minor chord, and then I'll pick, say, this is the raised fifth or the sixth degree of the scale. And I'll start changing the note underneath it. Right? It's very science of life. <laughs> very ascendant, right? Like you can hear it. Okay, so that's another thing you can think about is keeping one part of your chord static and the other part is in motion, all right? So that's also a really good concept when it comes to ambient is saying, 
All right, well, I'm gonna stay here and then provide all the movement that I need up here and play around. Ambient music is all about slow, subtle changes, right? So if you think about something that you're playing at a very slow beat per minute tempo, uh, you want something to move over time and really morph and change. So that's the concept that I really wanna bring across is that, you know, you don't have to say, you know, start here and then all of a sudden move to C major and then you're at D minor and then you're, you know, at another chord over here and, it doesn't have to be this big flurry of chords like you hear in, in other genres of music, such as pop and you know uh, any anything you could imagine that's not ambient. Ambient is very slow. It's the same concept, but just stretched out and moved across you know a, an entire timeline. All right, because that's the feeling that you're trying to get. You're you're floating. You're suspended. Right. Speaking of suspended, check this out. Hear that? There's that magic chord. Nice, huh? So if I took an EQ to that and limited the frequencies, say around 600 to 1000 hertz, you could really start to understand how you can get some tense, dense atmospheres with just a couple simple notes. Thank you guys so much for watching. I truly appreciate it. You know, I love doing tutorials like this because it's hands-on and you guys get to learn some really cool concepts that maybe you've been kicking around in your head or maybe you didn't fully understand. And yeah, I get to explain them to you in this sort of classroom format. It's a lot of fun. And this is just the beginning. So we're gonna do several more music theory tutorials on this channel. We're just getting started. If you guys want to learn more in the meantime, be sure to check out my Patreon. We've got so much cool things happening over there. I've got preset packs that are being released. We've got the Science Circle, which meets every single month and I provide track feedback. Uh, and some of the people in the Science Circle have really made some huge strides over the past couple months. So I'm super excited about that. And there's a lot of extra tutorials on there and a lot to look forward to. So be sure to check it out. Link is down below. Truly appreciate it, you guys. Happy ambient music banking. <laughs> and uh, take good care. As always, keep your heads in the clouds and your feet planted firmly on the ground. My name is Chris from Signs of Life. And we'll see you guys in the next one.